Student clients, welcome back to another edition of the NMS eLearning Systems YouTube channel, brought to you by the DLA Guru. Hey everybody, Michael June here with Game Changers for Government Contractors. I've got Kiwi here with me today, and we are going to be talking about DLA. But before we get started, why don't you take a minute, tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do. Hi, Mike. Yeah, my name is Kiwi Hendricks, and I am a DLA guru. I am a government contractor. I've been servicing the U.S. military by way of the Defense Logistics Agency for probably for the past 20 plus years. My background is mechanical engineering. I worked in industry for about 10 years. Some really big defense contractors I worked for in my past life. Decided to just go ahead with my government contracting endeavors. Joined the 8A program back in 2009. So as everyone knows, to be a part of the 8A program, you have to be 100% self-employed. And so I decided to leave the comforts of corporate America to pursue government contracting from that level. I was very successful in the 8A program. Our company graduated in 2018, and nice. we've worked with a wide array of different federal agencies through the 8A program. We're also a part of the Hub Zone program, so we've continued to work with federal agencies through the Hub Zone program, as well as supporting the Defense Logistics Agency along the way. How long have you been working with DLA specifically? Basically, since college, I kind of said I burned the candle at both ends of the stick as it related to working nine to five and then working DLA in the late 90s, early wow. 2000s is when when I caught wind of the DLA and decided to learn how to be very successful in bidding supply contracts with the DLA. For those that don't know, can you explain a little bit about DLA and its role in the government contracting world? The Defense Logistics Agency, they're one of the largest procurement arms for the U.S. military. They procure about $50 billion worth of products and services. They're more on the product side of the coin for the U.S. federal government, again, namely the Department of Defense. Anything that you can think that the Department of Defense requires as far as products, the DLA buys. They are a support organization also to the GSA, General Services Administration, but the DLA is kind of its own purchasing arm within itself as it relates to the FAR and things of that nature. They are very centric to small businesses as well. Last I checked, the DLA does about 84% of its occurrences are earmarked with small businesses from land and maritime division that is like vehicles and things like that. They buy spare parts as well as actual vehicles themselves, troop support where they're buying everything that the soldier needs from the apparel that they wear, as well as ammunitions and things like that. And then there's DLA energy where they buy all the fuel that fighter jets, vehicles that would consume as it relates to supporting the warfighter in that arena. What attracted you to DLA out of all the areas you could focus on? Was there something specifically about it that just made you go, I'm going to go all in on this and eventually become the DLA guru? I think it was just the barriers to entry were very low back in mm. like the again, late 90s, early 2000s. And again, you know, I'm kind of dating myself because back then faxes, we used to fax RFQs <laughs> back and forth to vendors and whatnot. Yeah. But I caught wind of the DLA through some seminars that I had attended back then with the SBA. When I looked at the DLA and looked at how easy it was to get involved in being able to bid, you didn't need certain specifications or training or anything of that nature. Literally, you log on to their bid board system, which is called Dibs, and you take a look at solicitations that are out there and and if you are able to get your hands on those products at a competitive price and you're able to bid, the DLA allows small businesses to bid. Now, again, you have to be registered through SAM in order to have a UEI number. I think back then, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was the CCR for those of us that remember the Central <laughs> Contract Register. But now again, it's SAM. But back then, again, it was just one of the easiest paths to getting involved in going after government contracts. My company actually started with the state of Missouri. So we're based out of Mm -hmm. Missouri, and we were going after Missouri state contracts that were on the Office of Administration's website. So again, it was around the time where e-commerce was kind of becoming a thing. Amazon was not a household name. And so we were trying to find ways of servicing state, local agencies. And then again, I caught wind of the federal government through the DLA. We said, wow, there's a lot of opportunity there. Was there a particular product that you focus on or product category, or did you come in and look at what they were buying and make your decision that way? How did you determine what you were going to sell? 
as an engineer coming from industry, the very first company that I worked with coming out of college was Anheuser-Busch. And I was a mechanical engineer for those guys. I think I was around what, 20, 21 years old, 22 years old, or something like that, and had this job. I was going around the plant and I just started getting accustomed to and working with vendors that did a lot of mechanical, like motors and pumps and things like that. I kind mm. of got used to seeing different manufacturing names and working with different vendors that were supporting engineering and the plant. When I caught wind of the DLA and went on dibs and I immediately started looking for those brand names, you know, for like the Dayton Motors mm. and things like that. So I never forget what some of the first contracts that I bid on were for Dayton Motors because because I knew what that was. And Granger was a source of supply at the time for Dayton. I remember seeing some opportunities for Dayton Motors and I said, well, let me see if I can buy them from Granger and resell them to the DLA. And that's exactly how I got involved with it. That's awesome. There's a lot of times people reach out to me and they're thinking about getting in the market. They have all these wild ideas of like, well, I think I can sell this. I think this might be hot. And I always go back and say, well, do you know anything about that? Is that part of your job history or maybe it's a hobby? Do you understand that technology or that product? And a lot of times the answer is no. You're going to have an uphill battle while you're trying to figure out the government and trying to learn a whole new product or product menu of things. It's so difficult. So I like hearing the story of somebody who like you knew those products, you know, you understood what they were and you just had to learn the government procurement process of it. So what are some of the biggest challenges do you think that contractors face when they're trying to work with DLA? Did you know we have our own government contracting community? It's called Federal Access. And inside Federal Access, you have all the tools, tips, strategies, documents, templates, everything you're ever going to need to be a government contractor. But you also get brought into our ecosystem. You get into our private LinkedIn group and you get into our live events and all that kind of thing when you become a member of Federal Access. To learn more, go to federal-access.com forward slash game changers. Now let's get back into this episode. Some of the biggest challenges and again, challenges that I've been able to live through for the past 20 years and skin my knee and learn is that there aren't a lot of resources as it relates to getting questions answered. I mean, you can reach out to the SBA office and a lot of times SBA folks are like, I don't know. And then, you know, there's the PTAC you know, organizations that they say, well, you know, you may try this or may try that. And literally going to the source, which is the DLA is sometimes not as easy. They do have their office of small business programs where you can reach out to those guys, but it's almost like they're very similar to the SBA where they may be kind of centric to their command, but a lot of times you just have to learn by doing case in point as a real example let's say you get a contract and you have these mill standard packaging and labeling requirements and so you may not necessarily know what is packaging code u what does that mean so you may reach out to the sba they won't know you may reach out to the deal right. they don't know it's, it's like you have to start asking a lot of questions and getting a lot of doors you know one door opens one door shuts and then you stumbled upon the information. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges. There is not a repository where you can go and just get all of like the cliff notes of how to do this. You literally have to just learn by doing, or you find folks like me who have done it. And again, we offer consulting services to assist folks that are brand new to the DLA to get those questions answered, especially if you can't get the answers to those questions from the, the more viable sources that are out there. That's probably one of the biggest challenges. It's hard to find answers to questions for small businesses with them. I 100% agree. I mean, I remember when we first started working with a client that was doing a lot of dibs work, there was just so many questions. And I remember that was a research project that was on my desk of, hey, find out what this means, find out what that means, find out when you're in the system, all these things. And so just trying to document all that stuff so we knew what it meant and how to go about it, even understanding what, like you mentioned earlier, some of the different divisions, whether it's troop support or whatever it is, learning that, learning the lingo, learning how it's divided because people think it's, well, it's just DLA. Yeah, it's DLA, but there's different divisions that do different things. They buy different stuff. There's different small business reps and all that kind of good stuff. And you just have so much to learn. Given that being a big challenge that there's a lot to learn, I know there's a lot of mistakes. What are some of the common mistakes that people make when they are trying to sell the DLA and maybe how do you avoid those? 
common mistakes that I found, and again, since we've launched our channel, we launched our channel back in October last year, and our YouTube channel is at the DLA Guru. I get a lot of student clients that reach out to me. And again, we offer a masterclass for new contractors who are interested in the DLA. They're able to participate with our masterclass, and then they graduate with the masterclass, and then they're ready. They get their cage code, and they're on dibs, and then they get their first traceability request. And they're like, okay, now what do I do now? After you get the traceability request, which is a great thing, meaning that the DLA is definitely looking to award a contract to you. A common mistake they do is they get the contract and they didn't factor in the labeling, for example, you know, they may get mm. a contract where they get 5,000 screws that they've been able to source and find a viable source of supply. But guess what? The QUP is one, meaning that they have to label and package each individual screw times 5,000. And they're like, this is going to take yeah. two months to do this. <laughs> they didn't understand that. Yeah, you have to factor that into your pricing as well as the delivery. You know, you can't say how can to get it yeah. delivered in 15 days just because you can get it shipped to your house in five days. It's going to take you time to package it and then the labor rate that right. you put on top of it if you hire some high schoolers or something like that to come help you package the things that's a common mistake not really understanding the depth and breadth of what the requirement is upon award again that's just trial and error you skin your knee and say oh man you know yeah. i'll know better next time kind of thing and i think not having the ability to find resources or consultants that can kind of help to guide you along the way to let you know what those high risk factors are when you're going after deal LA solicitations is another common mistake I think a lot of new contractors make as well. Speaking of the labeling, we had a client one time came to us and they were like, hey, I've got this problem with DLA. We shipped this thing 60 days ago and it's not showing up as received by them. What's going on? And long story short, I think they went to the facility and the guys were like, oh yeah, we have that. It's in the back because it's not labeled right and we can't accept it into the receiving. And it was a situation, you thought 5,000 was a bad number. It was 60,000 wow. items. It was like these plumbing parts. Parts, and they were like, each one is supposed to be in its own individual bag with its own individual label. And it's 60,000 parts. So imagine the weight and the size of the boxes or crates or whatever it is for 60,000 plumbing parts. Eventually, DLA was like, you got two choices. We can ship it back to you and you can label it at your cost, shipping your at your cost, labeling at your cost. And then you can ship it back to us again at your cost, or you can just pay us to label it properly but we're not gonna accept it until you come up with one of those options. <laughs> That was a painful mistake because the client was like, well, it's going to eat our profit to pay you to do it, but we'd rather do that than ship it back and then label it and then ship it back. Yeah, it was a painful lesson for somebody on labeling. That can be one of those big ones. I'm glad you pointed that one out. What do you have as maybe like your three to five like insider tips, tricks working with DLA? Maybe you've got a couple of those that you could share with us. I would say don't spread your web too vast because I think a lot of times there are so many solicitations that you say, hey, I want to do light bulbs. I want to do pumps. I want to do motors. You know, I want to do screws. Yeah. I, I want to do masks. I want to do boots. I want to do toothbrushes. And you find yourself getting overwhelmed with trying to manage mm. too many federal too supply many classifications, too many products. I always say, and again, you alluded to in the beginning of our conversation that go with what you know. And a lot of times with our student clients, they always say, hey, what can we sell? And I say, well, what do you know about? What is your background? You know, what have you done forever? Oh yeah, well, I was a firefighter. Well, okay. Well, the DLA, they buy firefighting products. So yeah. what type of manufacturers do you remember? Like who made the axes that you use in fire extinguishers? Do you know any of those types of brands? Were you able to work with vendors? Can you access those vendors that supplied you guys with those products? That's where you start and kind of work in that arena. So that's kind of a tip. I think getting really good when you first get involved with the DLA at one particular FSC code or classification would probably behoove you the best. And that way you don't get burnout because you can easily get burnout with the DLA. You're bidding all these contracts. You're not winning them. Your hit ratio is lower than what you want it to be. And then you kind of give up on it. So that's one tip. Another tip that comes to mind as it relates to the DLA would be being as communicative as possible. So like, let's say that you're looking at a solicitation. It's maybe a new opportunity for you. You've never bid on it before. Looking on your solicitation and actually reaching out to the contract administrator and introducing yourself. A lot of folks don't do that. My model mm -hmm. to my student clients is people do business with people they know and people they like. Even though the DLA, they have an automated award system that's in place, but there's still an opportunity for you to kind of 
be that person, that phone call, that email that's behind that particular national stock number, because you may not win it this time, but if you keep going after it and keep that lines of communication open, it has served well for us. It does allow you to have that working relationship. I'll leave with a third tip. A lot of folks, they may say, well, okay, here we are with the federal government. And this applies not only to the DLA, but even outside the DLA, just other branches of the U.S. government, whether it be the Department of Energy or Social Security Office, or even you know the U.S. military, let's say Air Force Base in, in your backyard. A lot of times it, it's a daunting task to find contacts within those organizations. But we have recently embarked on LinkedIn. A lot of folks don't recognize that LinkedIn is a great source to get contacts within those agencies agencies because one, a lot of times those agencies will have like a LinkedIn homepage and then you can find all the different employees for that particular command mm -hmm. or group that are linked in to that command. You literally can just go through that as like a library of like different points of contact and find the folks that are decision makers. You can start to reach out to them to request a capability brief. We started kind of doing that this year and we booked a bunch of capability briefs with high level managers within different federal agencies just to say, hey, this is who we are. And those conversations beget more conversations that you may land opportunities that you may not have known about. So that's another tip. And, and you did that right through LinkedIn. Right through LinkedIn, yes. So many people discount the value of LinkedIn. It blows my mind, especially for a mostly free platform. I mean, it's one of the few platforms where you don't have to upgrade. I've never upgraded to the paid version and I get so much value out of what I have. I don't even know what I do with the paid version because I wouldn't have time to use it all. There's so much value on that platform from looking up stuff like that to interacting with people. It's just a, such a good platform. You mentioned something that I want to go back to for a second. Looking at dibs, I know there are automated awards. I believe there's still some that are, there's a person involved. Is that correct? Because I think there's a letter code that's different in the solicitation to let you know whether it's going to be automated or not. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, the letter code is U or T in the ninth position of the solicitation number. So if you see a U or T, and the way I kind of think of it, I say auto, U-T. It's in the part of the word auto. Yeah. That's a hack. And if it's in the ninth position, you know that that's going to be an automated award where you don't really have a lot of influence there. But even though it's automated, I still say it doesn't hurt to reach out and just start to kind of have a communication to say, hey, this is who we are. Here's our capability statement. You know, we're going to be going after this particular solicitation. And yeah. then even having dialogues where you say, hey, if there are any other FSC codes that you guys are having difficulty finding folks to bid against it, let me know what those are because we may be able to go yeah. out there and hunt those down for you as well. DLA does, even though they have thousands of solicitations that go out daily, there are a lot of them that don't get responses. It's good to kind of know what those are. And that can also be an emerging opportunity for small businesses as well. Yeah, I want to come back to that here in a second because I want to ask one more question about the automated side. Do you have any tips for pricing or any tips for how to navigate those automated awards? Because I know that could be frustrating for people of they go in, they think they're putting their best foot forward, and then the system picks somebody else. Is there anything the system's looking for or tricks maybe that you have off the top of your head? Maybe it's just one thing that could make that process better for people listening. The best tip that I would suggest and what I train our team internally is that we never get ourselves down into the weed. You know, the worst mm -hmm. way to do business is to compete on price. You want to compete on value. That's what you compete on. And so as long as you are pricing it to where it's a value to your organization, then you should be able to sleep well at night. If you try to undercut yourself just to go out to the business and then you get a contract where your margins are so low that you're literally working for pennies, who's winning? The only person that's winning in that equation is the government. You don't want that. Now, if you want to try to price yourself to be competitive, let's say if you have a, a great opportunity where the margins could be 30% and you're like, should I price it 29% or should I do 15%? Again, it really has to link back to your operating costs, whatever your overhead is. You want to factor in what are you worth? Case in point, with a company that you you mentioned they had the 60,000 widgets and they didn't do the labeling correctly. They have to factor in to label 60,000 units. Like how much time does that take? And what is your hourly rate that you want to be paid for that specialized right. service and factor that into your pricing. And guess what? If you don't win and another company wins at a lower price point, that's their headache. They won't be in business long if they keep doing business that way. Stand firm on your square and make sure that you are doing this to benefit 
your company, I think is the best way of going about that. It's better to lose the bid than to win it and make no money. It's definitely the the takeaway I have on that one. I'm talking about competition, do you see that most of the bids you chase have a lot of competition on them? Because you mentioned sometimes there's nobody that can supply something or they're not supplying because maybe they aren't looking in the system. How tough is the competition on DLA? I'm glad you brought that up because with the barriers to entry being so low, you would think there will be so much competition going after these national stock numbers. And once you kind of get involved, you'll see it's literally the same three or four companies that win it over and over again for the past 10, 15 years. Because another thing about the DLA that I didn't mention, they buy consumable items. So a lot of times what they're buying, they're going to buy it again and again and again. Very rarely do you run across a national stock number where there is no past award history on a national stock number. And I think the DLA is like the world's best kept secret to that point. And I think your channel, as well as ours, getting out talking about government contracting the DLA, I think this is getting ready to be kind of maybe the next boom, in my opinion, like how the Airbnbs and the tour of the world. I think the DLA is going to be one day become a household name. I think it will benefit the DLA in more ways than one. And why they don't market in the 20 years that I've been a DLA a vendor, there's really no marketing. A lot of student yeah. clients have never even heard of the DLA. I would agree with that. It's very quiet where like everybody knows about the Army, the Air Force. They know about the FBI. They know about HHS. And those are all these coveted contracts for agencies. And yet people don't even think about DLA and all the money that's going through there. I'm I'm glad you mentioned about the consumables. You know, I have a guy that sells the blue tarp sheeting. That's one of those things where we look and go, oh, hey, when are they buying it? Oh, look at that. They're buying it several months before hurricane season. That makes sense. Oh, they bought however much of it this year year and they bought it the last year and the last year. Okay. So we know they're probably going to buy that much or more in the next years. It's so interesting when you look at that and realize, Hey, there's this flow of stuff. And as long as you learn how to price it, you can source it when you can be competitive, you can win these contracts. The people don't even paid any attention. I think that's pretty wild. Any final thoughts here? I know you have a YouTube channel. It's focused on this, the DLA guru. Any final thoughts you want to share with folks, whether it's about DLA or about the channel or anything else today? Again, we are a very new channel. I get a lot of feedback saying folks love the content, that it's it's spot on. I get a lot of eyes on the channel, but not a lot of subscribers. So we're interested in getting the subscribership up for sure, because that only helps to promote our message and stokes the YouTube algorithm. Very excited. It's a new world for me to get involved in talking in front of a camera and kind of getting the word out about the world's largest customer in the DLA and also trying to position our organization to be a safe place for new contractors to kind of lean on us and take a look at our masterclass and book a session and receive as much of the content that I'm trying to put out there to educate. Because I think by increasing competition with the DLA, I think, you know, a lot of folks say, well, why are you putting a secret out there? I just think it's good to help people. I think the U.S. economy is in a place where folks are really looking for new opportunities. People are kind of over the nine to five. There are a lot of entrepreneurs out there going after the Airbnb and the Turo and all these different Bitcoin. And I say, hey, working with the U.S. federal government is a recession proof industry. I kind of feel like it's so big that I invite the competition. I think it'll only make the DLA better with more folks uh, working towards a common goal of helping to increase business and helping people change their lives and change their families' lives. I totally agree. There's a lot of room in this market. There's a lot of contracts that never get fulfilled because the government can't find a supplier. They can't find a vendor. And so think about that of the billions of dollars that get spent. And yet there's contracts that will wind up not going out because they just don't have a source. So maybe that's, you know, your answer. If you're listening today and you're trying to figure out how to get in the market and you sell mostly products, the DLA is a great place for that. Thank you for coming on and talking about this. Thank you for starting the channel. I look forward to learning more. By the way, I do think you're doing a great job on the channel and just encourage you to keep going. It's going to be great over the years. I look forward to watching the growth of that. Thank you again. I really appreciate you coming on today. Thanks for having me, Mike. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed the podcast today. If you did, I would really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe to the podcast and screenshot it and tag me on LinkedIn or whatever social media you use. So thank you again for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Please don't forget to check out my flagship masterclass, Eight Steps to Successful Federal Supply Contract Bid Submissions to the DLA. This masterclass provides a balanced approach to virtual education and is designed for both beginners and seasoned companies alike. 
with proven techniques on the best way to position your organization to being successful with winning federal supply contracts with the DLA. The masterclass contains three and a half hours worth of content, along with proprietary and recommended software tools designed to empower you for success with the DLA. Check out the links provided in the description below to learn more today. Thanks again for watching and for tuning in to this exciting announcement. I'm Parker Winslow, signing out.